out. All right. Nice. Okay, great. Because a lot of people are going to want to see this afterwards. Um, so welcome to everybody who's joining us. We're going to just start in like five minutes to let everybody get in. In the meantime, you know, me, Rebecca, and Lydia are going to have some very kind of natural off-the-cuff chit-chat back and forth until 12.05. Oh, and Annalie, sorry. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have some unnatural chit chat. Just Annalie to add, is kind of. Some... I know that Annalie's in busy trying to let everybody read in for the waiting room, so I didn't yeah. want to force them to take part in the chit chat. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and uh, you know, I just wanted to say we have raised six thousand five hundred and thirty yes. something dollars oh, for Green so Arcade. Wonderful. This is our second most successful event after the event we did for Marcus Books. I'm so freaking stoked that we were able to do so much to help local bookstores and this local bookstore in particular, which is such a local treasure and is such a, it's such a beautiful store. And um, so, yay, I'm so excited to be here. This is so much fun. And so I love- One thing, one thing that folks know, this is not chit chat. This is from your robotic moderator here. Um, you will not be able to chat with each other. It just helps us cut down on noise in the in the chat area. So if you chat, you only are talking to me. So all you can do is ask me questions that you would like to ask our guests. Um, so don't like ask me about random stuff or tell me about your cats. <laughs> I mean, actually do tell me about your cats if you want to. Um, and if you want to show us your cats right now while you're waiting, that'd be great. Or your dogs or yeah, your lizards show us your or pets. your birds or your swan. You, Very. Everybody has a dragon. I have a swan. Lydia <laughs> hiding some mermaids and seahorses in there somewhere. Ooh. I am wearing this blanket thing that is shaped as a mermaid tail. So the mermaid is here. <laughs> What's shaped? What's where's the mermaid tail? It's on this blanket I have on my leg since I'm not wearing <laughs> pants. <laughs> you pants. <laughs> pants are obsolete. Yeah. Nobody Why do we even pants need anymore. pants anymore? I feel like you know. Seriously. Whenever anyone says, like, why do we have to wear masks? I'm like, well, why do you have to wear pants? Like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I literally just started watching Avatar The Last Airbender. And there's this thing where Ang says to his friends, where we're going, we won't need pants. And they're just like, no pants. And I'm like, Love it. yes, it's very appropriate for right now. It's an adorable sentiment for people under three. Yes. <laughs> Most people over three. As a San Franciscan, thinking of the Bay to Breakers and the wrong naked guys in the Castro, I just want to say, I know. And, and uh, so, you know, if we're waiting to, we're, we're still letting people in, I would be very happy to say a word or two about the Green Arcade for those. I think, please, that. or should we I wait until we start? Wait until people. Okay, then, then let us stay. Thank you, everyone who's here. I saw yeah. some lovely faces. And this is super exciting, and I'm really happy to be here with these lovely people in my favorite bookstore. Yeah, it's so awesome. I'm so happy that we're doing this. And uh, yeah, in two minutes, we'll start. And we will definitely start by saying some words about the Green Arcade, uh, because okay. I want to make sure everybody hears that. Because okay. it's, you know, and you can always, if you supported Green Arcade at this event, you can always support them more afterwards. And um, is there, you know, Charlie Jane, um, somebody was uh, just commenting that they weren't able to get donation to work on Eventbrite. Is there another way to donate to the bookstore? Uh, that's a really good question. Maybe just email you if it's, unless this is a problem that lots of people are having. Um, or email. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I mean, they could send more money to the PayPal that all of these donations were going to in the first place which I will tell you what that is in a second. If you unmute Patrick, he can also tell you very quickly. I will um, unmute Patrick. He would, hey, yeah, Patrick. Patrick Mark. Uh, how can people best support the bookstore if they want to support more after this event? You'll also get a chance to talk at the end. Sorry. All right. I was just going to say, you know, uh, I have a nice online uh, store that you can visit that has Charlie's books and Rebecca's and... Uh, Lydia's as well. So that would be the best is to help all of us and to keep uh, all of our uh, writing and reading life alive. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. I just want you to know that you have a lot of fans in the audience. It's a lot of excited people saying hello to you. <laughs> okay, it's 12.05. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for being here and for supporting Green Arcade Bookstore. 
I'm so incredibly thrilled that we were able to raise at last, uh, I, just before we got a lot of last minute orders, we were able to raise $6,564 for this amazing bookstore, which I think is gonna go a, a good ways towards helping to keep it here after the pandemic is over. Bookstores are like the lifeblood of our communities and we desperately need them to be here for us. So I'm so grateful to all of you who were able to help out. And I'm so excited that we're here with Rebecca Solnit and Lydia Yukovich. And so I think we're gonna start out by having, you know, maybe Rebecca and Lydia can tell us about what bookstores mean to them and specifically what Green Arcade means to them. And then we'll have a reading. Uh, who wants to go first? Well, I don't know if Lydia's been to the Green Arcade. Have you, Lydia? Not yet. Well, you got to come down here when people are allowed to like go places <laughs> and go into places and stuff. But uh, so then, can I say a word about it? It um, was founded by Patrick and belongs to Patrick Marks, who is a book buyer at Cody's Books, a legendary Berkeley bookstore for many years. So he came in as a pro knowing exactly what kind of a bookstore he wanted to make. And he made a magical space full of environmental books, political books, no diet books, no celebrity tell-all trash memoir as told to, unless they're really fun and campy. And um, his husband, is, who's also very involved in the store and drew its logo, was at City Lights Forever, where he bought the art books. So it's, you know, it's sort of a jewel of a bookstore for queerness, for... Um, San Francisco-ness, it actually has a historic jukebox from uh, an old Italian restaurant in North Beach that closed many years ago, a huge laundry sign from a closed Chinese laundromat. So Patrick's husband, Gent, helped me immensely and was my, nicer to me than anyone else at City Lights with my first book. Um, they're both in uh, my first atlas where and I claim that for the Green Arcade, I'm the bookstore cat. Um, and Gent is um, the husband, or husband, as Patrick calls him, is all over this book. But it's just, it's on Market Street, people wander in. It's like wandering into a bar where Patrick is like the bartender who helps you figure out what your cocktail of choice is. And he does beautiful events and readings. He's been a great part of the community. Works with McRoskey's Mattress Factory across the street, whose top floor is the most magical event space in the city to do bigger events. I've had a lot of my book debuts there. And it's just kind of what you dream a bookstore is. Lou Reed once said, my life was saved by rock and roll because Lou Reed was really cool. I am much less cool. My life was saved by libraries and bookstores. And uh, the Green Arcade has been my safe space, happy home, and uh, sort of alcohol light tavern for the, God, how long is it now? It's, will be 12 years this fall when they opened. Patrick opened it just as the economy collapsed in 2008. So he's weathered one of these already. So, but Lydia, what about you in bookstores? Well, for my entire adult life, which I think began when I was about 12, <laughs> that my understanding of bookstores is that they were safe havens for people like me. So when I got spit out of family, it was a place to go to uh, feed myself, nourish myself, and feel less alone. When I got spit out of academia, it was a place I could still go and teach myself the same shit <laughs> <laughs> and uh, own it differently without passing through the hierarchies. And when I got spit out of marriages or relationships of various kinds, it gave me comfort emotionally and even physically because I'm one of the people who will rub the books on her body in addition to reading them. And sometimes I gum them. <laughs> and, um, I've, I've had sexual um, experiences upon books. There's nothing I haven't done with books. And so bookstores were an alternative definition of home for some of us, maybe legions of us, where we felt counted, where our minds and our bodies and our experiences, there was a room you could go into where it was reflected back to you and you weren't as alone as you thought you were. And so the saving of the lifeline, um, I would agree with that. And it's happening to me still, which is why there's a morning space there. 
and partly why we're doing things like this to keep a tether, to keep a love line and to keep a lifeline to the bookstores and the people who run them who have saved our lives. I never quite put it this way before, but I think bookstores and libraries are the only places in which nothing bad has ever happened to me. They've happened to me in houses and gyms and locker rooms and on the street and hospitals and all kinds of places, but airplanes, man spreading and worse, <laughs> but never in a bookstore. They that's have, a good that's a good thought i think i might share that yeah. experience with you yeah i think that's part of it there's sanctuaries not only because every book is a door that opens onto some new world or meet, lets you meet some person uh, safely but also because they're staffed by sympathetic gentle people who are you know they're, they're yeah i agree yeah Okay, so we're gonna do a, a, a reading now for about like 15, 20 minutes and then have a conversation. So who wants to read first? I think Rebecca spoke first about bookstores. So Lydia, do you wanna read first? Sure. Ready. Uh, and just if you didn't see it posted in the chat, Lydia is the national bestselling author of the novels, The Book of Joan and The Small Books Facts of Children, winner of the 2016 Oregon Book Awards, Ken Kesey Award for Fiction, as well as the Reader's Choice Award, the novel Dora Headcase, a critical book on war and narrative, allegories and violence, allegories of violence. Her critically, her widely acclaimed memoir, The Chronology of Water, Water was a finalist for a Penn Center USA Award for Creative Nonfiction and a winner of a PNBA Award and the Oregon Book Award Reader's Choice. The Misfits Manifesto, a book on her based on her recent TED Talk, was published by TED Books. And finally, a new collection of fiction, Verge, is due out from Riverhead Books in winter. 2020. And yay, everybody clap silently for Lydia. So I'm going to read a, a shorter piece that's a bit of a love letter. Uh, it's from this book, The Chronology of Water, otherwise known as the Boob Book. <laughs> it's called Dreaming in Women. Sometimes a mine is just born late, like mine was coming through waves on a slower journey. You never ever in the end understand until you do that you were never alone. Isn't it a blessing what becomes from inside the alone sometimes? With Marguerite Duras, you must lie down on a bed in an apartment in a foreign city, foreign to you, foreign enough so that you become the foreigner Lose your name and your language, lose your identity moorings, lose your thoughts. There must be shutters on the tall, slightly open windows. The room must be blue, the floor made of stone. You must be naked, her breath a whisper against your skin, up the length of your body, down. You must listen for the sounds of the city moving all around you. You must listen then beyond that to the ocean and wind beyond all human motion. And then you must listen beyond that even to the blood in your ears and the drum of your heart and how a lover's skin stories over you at night. Night. It will rain. Open the windows. Desire wets. There is no inside out but the body. Love unto death. With Gertrude Stein, there will be eating and paper, tea and money. She will say it gracefully. She will say it with ice cream, eating, paper, a flesh circle, so kind. And then again, 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 Make quiet for Emily Dickinson. Sing gently a hymn in between the heaves of storm. Let the top of your head lift. See, there are spaces between things. What you thought was nothing carries everything of life in it. In the next room, HD has brought the walls down, but look how the light dances across the floor of things differently now. Even your feet are new. Look around you in the alone. See everything differently. With Elaine Sixu, you must close your eyes and open your mouth wider, no wider, no wider. So open your throat opens, give voice. With Jean Rees, come through the vast corpus of literature like water cut the Grand Canyon. Adrian Rich went down into the depths ahead of you. For you, her dive brought the possibility of language up to your surface. Breathe, take the breath, 
you have it. With Margaret Atwood and Doris Lessing, you will learn to stiffen your spine. Jeanette Winterson will make a small thing enormous as the cosmos. Toni Morrison will let you cry home the passage. Leslie Marmon Silko whispers the story is long, no longer, no longer than that even, longer than anything you can imagine. Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath will drink with you at the bar and no one will point and laugh. And when you need to feed the ground of your life and the heart of the world, there will be bonfire at the edge of a canyon under a night sky where Joy Harjo will sing your bone song. With Virginia Woolf, there will perhaps be a long walk in a garden or along a shore, perhaps a walk that will last all day. She will put her arm in yours and gaze out and your backs will be history. In front of you, just the ordinary day, which is of course your entire life, like language. I am in a midnight blue room, my writing room, with a blood red desk, a room with rituals and sanctuaries and books. I made this room myself. It took me my whole life. I reach down below my desk and pull up a bottle of scotch. It's Balvenie, 30 year, in case you care. I pour myself an amber shot. I drink. Warm lips, throat. I close my eyes. I am not Virginia Woolf, but there is a line of hers that has kept me well. Arrange whatever pieces come your way with books in your life. I am not alone. Whatever else there was or is, the books are with me and writing is in me. Wow, that was so beautiful. I'm so glad you mentioned Doris Lessing. I feel like Doris Lessing deserves like way more props than she ever gets. She's one of my favorite authors of all time. Same. And Same. I love Touch her so much. Touch I think about her all the time. Oh my God, that was so beautiful. And now we're going to hear a reading from Rebecca Solnit. Oh my God, I can't even believe it. Uh, okay, so Rebecca Solnit, writer, historian, and activist. She is the author of more than 20 books on feminism, Western and indigenous history, popular power, social change, and insurrection wandering and walking, hope and disaster, including whose story is this? Call them by their true names, winner of the 2018 Kirkus Prize for Nonfiction, Cinderella Liberator, Men Explain Things to Me, The Mother of All Questions, and Hope in the Dark. She is the co-creator of the City of Women map, um, a trilogy of atlases of American cities, The Far Away Nearby, A Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, Wander Lost, A History of Walking, and River of Shadows, Earward, Maybridge, and the Technological Wild West, for which she received a Guggenheim, the National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism, and the Lander Lenner Award. Her forthcoming memoir, Recollections of My Exist Non-Existence, I think actually just came out, so it's not forthcoming anymore. It's, was, it's back coming. It's uh, whatever the opposite of forthcoming is. And uh, please, Clap silently and applaud and cheer and hoot for Rebecca Solnit. Oh, is Rebecca muted? Rebecca's muted. Can we unmute Rebecca? Uh, there we go. I'm here. Okay. Does that work? <laughs> Technology. Yes. <laughs> Technology. Oh my God. And Dor but Doris Lessing, so lovely to hear her praise. She did get a Nobel Prize very late in life, but I still, you know, she could still be recognized and read a lot more. She was huge for me, as so many books were. So because we're celebrating and supporting a bookstore, I decided to read this from The Far Away Nearby. Like many others who turn into writers, I disappeared into books when I was very young disappeared into them like someone running into the woods. What surprised and still surprises me is that there was another side to the forest of stories and the solitude, that I came out that other side and met people there. Writers are solitaries by vocation and necessity. I sometimes think the test is not so much talent, which is not as rare as people think, but purpose or vocation which manifests in part in the ability to endure a lot of solitude and keep working. Before writers are writers, they are readers, living in books, through books, in the lives of others that are also the heads of others, 
in that act that is so intimate and yet so alone. These vanishing acts are a staple of children's books, which often tell of adventures that are magical because they travel between levels and kinds of reality, and the crossing over is often an initiation into power and into responsibility. They are, in a sense, allegories, first for the act of reading, of entering an imaginary world, and then of the way that the world we actually inhabit is made up of stories, images, collective beliefs, all the immaterial appurtenances we call ideology and culture, the pictures we wander in and out of all the time. In children's books, there are inanimate objects that come to life, speaking statues, rings and words of power, talismans and amulets, and most of all, there are doors. Particularly in the series that I, like so many children, took up imaginative residence in for many years, The Chronicles of Narnia. I read one in fourth grade after a teacher who barely knew me handed it to me in the school library, back when schools had libraries. And I should say here, the part of my bio Charlie didn't read, but that I like a lot uh, um, is that from kindergarten to graduate school, I'm a product of the California education system, California public education system may it soon and safely resume. And, uh, but in my day, the schools were well-funded and they had libraries. I can still picture his mustache and the wall of books and wooden bookshelves. I read it, The Horse and His Boy, and read it again, and then began to save up to buy the seven books, one at a time. The paperbacks came from the, um, came from the enchanted bookstore in the middle of town, the Amber Griffin, whose kind proprietor rewarded me with the case in which the seven books fit when I had paid for the last one out of my tiny allowance saved up over a period of more than a year to get all seven. I still have the box set a little tattered, though I think no one but me has read them. When I took one out recently, I noticed how dirty the white back of the book was from my small filthy fingers then. Much has been written about the Christian themes, British boarding school mores, and other contentious aspects of the series, but little has been said about its doors. There is, of course, the wardrobe in the first book C.S. Lewis wrote, the wardrobe made of wood cut from an apple tree, grown from seeds from another world, that when the four children walk into it, sometimes opens onto that world. Two of the other books feature a doorway that stands alone, so that when you walk around it, it's just a frame, three pieces of wood in the landscape. But when you step through it, it leads to another world. There's a painting of a boat that comes to life as the children tumble over, uh, tumble over the picture frame into the sea in another world. There are books and maps that come to life as you look at them. And there's the wood between the worlds in the book, The Magician's Nephew, which tells the creation story for Narnia a wood described so enchantingly, I sometimes still think of it as a vision of peace. It's more serene and more strange than the rest of the books with their busy symbolisms, talking beasts, dwarves, witches, battles, enchantments, castles, and the rest. The young protagonist puts on a ring and finds himself coming up through a pond, of, or rather a pool to the forest. Lewis writes, it was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals, and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just gotten out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few yards as far as his eye could reach. You could almost feel the trees drinking the water up with their roots. This wood was very much alive. It is the place where nothing happens, the place of perfect peace. It is itself not another world, but an, but an unending expanse of trees and small ponds, each pond like a looking glass you can go through to another world. It is a portrait of a library, just as all the magic portals are allegories for works of art, across whose thresholds we all step into other worlds. Libraries are sanctuaries from the world and command centers onto them. Here in quiet rooms are the lives of a crazy horse, 
and Buffalo Bill, the Hundred Years' War and the Opium Wars and the Dirty War, the ideas of Simone Weil and Lao Tzu, information on building your sailboat or dissolving your marriage, fictional worlds and books to equip the reader to re-enter the real world. They are, ideally, places where nothing happens and where everything that has happened is stored up to be remembered and relived. The place where the world is folded up into boxes of paper. Every book is a door that opens on to another world, which might be the magic that all these children's books were alluding to. And the library or a bookstore is a Milky Way of worlds. The object we call a book is not the real book, but its potential, like a music score or a seed. It exists fully only in the act of being read and its real home is inside the head of the reader where the symphony resounds, the seed germinates. A book is a heart that only beats in the chest of another. Thank you and thank you bookstores and libraries and the people who take care of them. Thank you readers who bring books to life I always feel when a book of mine that's been out for a while finds a reader, it's like it comes out of storage, out of dormancy and comes alive again. And so I'm really always grateful when people stumble across something old and bring it back to life and love seeing forgotten books get resuscitated and paid attention to again, the way that feminism and queer studies uh, Black studies, Asian American studies, etc., has brought new books into focus. And um, so thank you readers and thank you listeners today for letting this seven-year-old book have a little moment of living in all the rooms and all the ears and all the heads of all the listeners. Agreed. Um, Agreed. That uh, was so beautiful. Sorry, you go on. Uh, Chronology of Water was written in 2011, and one thing I love about what Rebecca just said is that for me in my life, and probably some of you, literature is alive, so it doesn't get born and then die. It's alive in people's bodies for as long as people are willing to pick up the books. Uh, the market does something else and, and tricks people into thinking there's a birth of a book, and then it's gone, and there's only the next new book. But bookstores are there to remind us that, you know, they're the womb of the living body of literature and it just takes a body walking in to find the book or let the book find them that will keep us all alive. And in that way, there's no like beginning or end or old book or new book. There's just, you know, language and bodies. What's also so interesting to me is that there are works of art that stay in front of our faces, we look at them, you know, the Mona Lisa, Beethoven's Ninth, whatever. But there's also works of art that dissolve into us and they're not in front of our face because they're behind our face in our imaginations. And often the works of art we celebrate are the kind of lone, monumental, manly, heroic masterpieces. But I think a lot of the work that matters is the stuff that dissolves into the air and fiber and food and water that we take in and form ourselves out of, that sometimes the stories that matter most are forgotten as themselves, but remembered as something else, or they become something else. They feed something that feeds something that becomes you, or they lie underneath as the foundational stories that, you know, and the far way nearby was so much about the way that we're, as Muriel Rukeyser once said, the world is not made out of atoms, it's made out of stories. And that sometimes those stories are wings and boats and, for Lydia, fins and tails and, <laughs> and, and maybe snorkels. And others are cages and, and prisons that trap us. And that so much the art of making a life is learning which stories liberate you and open up your eyes and which ones shut everything down which ones connect to you and give you possibilities. And so interesting in the pandemic, seeing the kind of war of stories, what does it mean to wear a mask? Is it a gesture of solidarity and generosity as so many of us see it? Or is it like some kind of male, you know, does it conflict with the absolute sort of ego freedom of masculinity? Of course it does both at once because absolute freedom of machismo needs to fuck off and die already 
And, um, but just seeing the different stories about how do we get through this? What, you know, what matters in this moment? And it's been interesting to me how much stories have mattered as part of how we get through this, which is why when it began, I started telling for fairy tales live on Facebook and did it for a month. And um, with listeners as of today, and really just thinking about what do fairy tales tell us in this moment and to tell children in this moment, because fairy tales despite all the fancy trappings, the witches and fairies and magic this and supernatural that and castles and palaces and pearls are really about small, low power, low status, usually lonely, abandoned, neglected, devalued people trying to find their way in the world and facing immense difficulties and opposition. So they felt right for that moment and were a reminder to me how stories get us through things when and other stories that people try and impose on us, punish us, tell us we're the wrong gender or shape or size or race, or that the talents we have aren't the talents that matter, or that you know we need to belong to some horrible group full of punitive people. Well, and um, speaking of high school, but I. Think that's <laughs> I I'm so with you on that, and uh, in my own community where we're trying to piece how do you get through this together just like everyone is we've also been entering as writers the form of the fairy tale like a kind of new wave fairy tale where what you can place and bring the difficulties and tensions and traumas of your life or also the current moment and story it as an alchemy as a transformational space because the form of the fairy tale, as you well know, Rebecca, and I'm chiming in with you and standing ovation with you, allows for that. It's, it's called magic, but it's also change and adaptation and resiliency. And, and this word magic is carrying a hell of a lot inside it. And so adults who are scared right now, we're writing fairy tales to each other at corporeal to remind ourselves we're also in the place of change resiliency and adaptation which is why i keep posting that picture of the tadpole pole going to frog it's i look at it every day to remind myself that even in the most extreme you know fearful places or places of radical change or discomfort um something is growing i don't know what it is yet i hope it's a tail <laughs> <laughs> for you it's tadpoles for me it's butterflies when a yeah. butterfly enters its cocoon it essentially liquidates itself into a kind of butterfly soup and the imaginal cells instruct the soup how to or rather when a caterpillar not yet a butterfly it, it uh, goes into a cocoon it it liquidates itself which makes me think of all those going out of business liquidation sales but it's not exactly like that maybe it's a little like that and then the imaginal cells are the maps and stories that tell it how to reform itself into something profoundly different with wings and et cetera. And there's a wonderful line by Pat Barker, I quoted in A Field Guide to Getting Lost, that, um, you know, that we want to think that transformation is all creative and generative, but a huge amount of it looks like decay and destruction. That's right. And I think of this moment as we are in the soup, some of the stories and ideas are imaginal cells. And it's both horrific and terrifying and full of great suffering, but also kind of exciting to see how people, how cities, for example, are reshaping public space so that bicycles and pedestrians take precedence over cars in more places, how people are rethinking how we do some things, how new networks are being formed unfortunately how corruption and apathy and the willingness to sacrifice other human beings is being laid naked you know exposed by the callousness of the you know open it back up because i need a haircut um business is more important than human life crowd but there's really there really is a sense i think of both internal transformation for a lot of people some of it very painful some of it constructive but also of kind of rethinking as people do when it's a personal crisis, a life-threatening illness or dis a small disaster or collectively in the big disasters I've written about, 
what really matters becomes clear and what doesn't matter also becomes clear and people emerge with kind of a new map or a new story about who they are and what they need and where we're going. And I feel like that some of that can happen as we shift out of this phase of the pandemic, it's going to be really important to hang on to what we've learned and assert those stories and not let them do this. Everything's back to normal. Forget everything you learned. Just fucking go shopping like they did after 9-11. The other thing I think about a lot is when I was a kid, everyone would talk about where they were when Kennedy was assassinated. And I was like soiling a diaper somewhere probably and do not remember it. And then how people, I remember, then when we had the big earthquake here in 89 in San Francisco, everyone talked about that. And then where they were when 9-11 happened. This is so much bigger. Those were like kind of sudden events. This is going to be months and maybe years of our lives. And whether you're three or 13 or 30, and people are, you know, whether you're a farm worker or a white collar worker, a mom with three kids, or a lonely person home alone, you know, whether you're recovering, as some of my friends are, or relatively untouched, whether in, you're in New York or Rio de Janeiro, people are, well, as somebody said, we're not all in the same boat, we're all in the same storm. But I think what's also really interesting, we're in a moment generating billions of stories of what was your pandemic that people will be talking about for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that, that motion of storytelling is something that can move us. Uh, you can't see this, no one can see this, Rebecca can't see this, but written on my wall, it says, it's okay, you're just going to goo, which is what <laughs> butterflies do in that transitional phase. And then underneath this, it says, reach for the next form, because that's what imaginal cells do in the cocoon stage they they carry the trace of the form that's coming and so those two lines are over there on my wall um and it's another place rebecca and i find a nexus without knowing it with each other in addition to many other secrets i shall not reveal <laughs> <laughs> i once went to the um the glass conservatory in golden gate park when it was full of butterflies yeah. hatching out and it was actually really stunning. We often treat butterflies, we represent them as though they're pretty flowers that fly and flat wings are pretty and butterflies are pretty. They're insects and their lives are very intense and maybe not an exactly nasty, brutish and short, but definitely short. But watching, I watched dozens of them and it was a difficult period in my own life, but I watched them come out of the cocoons and it was so intense. Sometimes a cocoon would shake before anything else happened and the shaking right. would be so intense it would cause the other cocoons to shake. But also when a butterfly comes out, its wings are all soft and crumpled. Yeah, they're un un unfurled. Yeah. And there's liquid in its body it has to pump into the wings that will then harden. And that all has to happen pretty fast. And I watched a butterfly that couldn't get all the way out of the cocoon, frantically struggling and disturbing all the other cocoons, reminding you that in some ways there's consciousness, some kind of awareness, awakeness, even as we think of the cocoons as sleeping. But it thrashed and thrashed and couldn't get free. And if it doesn't get its wings straightened out, you know, and I also feel like, so we're in this soup, but when we come out of the pandemic, we're gonna face this struggle of straightening out our wings and yeah. pumping full of what we learned or or they'll be crumpled or we won't hatch out <clears throat> and that's going to be a really interesting next phase charlie is showing us her wings they're <laughs> right. wings are yes. very nice yeah. i i have my black swan here and um by uh celine uh perez from creativity explored not a wonderful art center for uh developmentally disabled adults not far from the green arcade but I, I'm just so interested in how we will have a storytelling battle. And we're in it now about what, yes. how much do we owe each other? Who matters? Yes. What's the most important thing? Is it the fucking haircut in business as usual? Is it making sure no one starves? And it's every, every battle, as activists have really taught me, uh, which is why my younger brother has a book called The Battle of the Story of the Battle of Seattle, 
drawn from Patrick Rainsborough's work about the battle of to tell the story about a political event, we're going to have a story battle. And this is part of why I think bookstores are so important. They are, our, you know, we talk about seed banks and, you know, in our militarized era, when people were afraid of urban insurrection, cities had armories and things, bookstores are our our story reserves, our equipment for understanding the future by understanding the past, of learning exactly where we are by going somewhere else and going out ready to build better stories, stories that, you know, listening, listen to, we learn to listen to other people's stories to imagine what it's like to be somebody else um, through these stories. We always treat empathy as though it's an emotion and in some ways it is an innate emotion but another thing that Far Away and Your Bi is about is that empathy is mostly a storytelling art. What is it like to be the very old man in the nursing home, the young child in the wheelchair, the mother pregnant with twins with no home? What is it, how do you imaginatively, how do you do the storytelling work to understand somebody else's experience? And that's what stories equip us to do in some ways, yes. you read, James Baldwin and learn if you're you know for a white kid like me it taught me a lot about being black you read you know these other times and places and kinds of people and um, you know and it gets you as they say it gets you out of yourself so I think I'm part of this is part of why we have to keep bookstores alive is that these are our arsenals of imagination to go do this work that we have to do every day, but that we have to do in a really intense way with the battle of the story that will also be the battle of the election. That is also sort of the battle for what this country is gonna become. And, um, you know, and so that's what we're doing. And that's what the Green Arcade has helped so many of us do with its amazingly well put together. I'm avoiding using the precious word curated. Tables of books, that are really like having someone point you towards what you need and sift through it for you, which is also something books do. There's a bookmark they were handing out at the Stanford libraries. It said, the internet can give you 10,000 answers, but a librarian can give you the right one. Amazon can give you 60 million books, but a really good independent bookstore will give you the 10,000 you wanna look at to find the five or 10 or 50 you need. And it's so different. Yeah, so we have some amazing questions from our audience. And actually, one of them relates to the, the butterfly kind of um, imagery that you all were both kind of talking about. Christina wants to know, you know, regarding the butterfly, caterpillar becoming a butterfly, what signs of transformation are you seeing that are good, that are, you know, inspiring or optimistic with regards to bookstores and literature and building community for now in the future. And kind of on a related note, um, Kat asked, you know, what books do you recommend for those of us who hope, hope that we won't go back to normal after this is over? Like normal meaning inequality and exploitation. Oh, wow. Do you want, and um, which, who should go first? Lydia, did you want to take that or should I jump in? Or? Well, I see signs that the possibility space uh, that always accompanies the fearful or destructive place. I see signs of it all around. The biggest one right away was all the animals started getting louder and coming back and inhabiting the areas of cities and public spaces where ordinarily we keep them out. That was such a wonderful early sign that, oh yeah, we've made a world where the animals can't be in it. Uh, and so that was like a good cue, a good sign that change is possible and change is afoot. A thing I've noticed specific to bookstores and literature and the, the economies that are not the money economy only, but all the other economies where we make human exchanges are opening up. Um, where I live, we're visiting our bookstores weekly in turns to make sure uh, there is a free flow of, of books getting into hands in our favorite bookstores, but we can't all do it every day. Like I can't go do that every day, curbside pickup, but a team of us can. And so we designated which week so-and-so would go do it for that week. Um, people, another sign I've noticed is people are, are 
buying different books. I've noticed a close attention to those books that um, were released and new during the pandemic, which includes both my book, which was released in February, and I was trying to be on tour when things went south <laughs> or east, west, north, all of the directions. And Rebecca's book also, her newest book happened during this strange time of, you know, difficulty. So people are paying attention to whose books are out and how can I help? That's amazing. Um, but they're also paying attention to what is a book and who do we want to be? And as Rebecca was speaking to earlier, what stories matter to me? Why? What stories am I suddenly turning away from because they're a load of shit and they're oppressing half the world? Maybe I want to turn away from those stories. What were the stories that saved my life? Are there books like that out there now? Can I get those stories into my body? Because we're, we're untethered from the machine of the stories that tell you to be the consumer and tell you to be the good citizen that serves the state. Because we have a little space, a little spacer, we're remembering we have bodies and we can ask again, what stories do I want to live in my body? So those are some of the ways of the signs that I see possible, enormous shifting and changing happening. Uh, and it is my hope as well that if we hit a point where people start venturing out again, I have no, long how, no idea how long that'll take, but let's say we hit a day where that starts happening again. If we go back to the same old, same old capitalist, consumer, patriarchal load of shit, uh, I'm gonna have to change my entire life to include delivering flaming bags of poo to every doorstep. <laughs> of every shithead <laughs> you know if you're willing to sign up for that legion um you know how to find me that is such a great question and thank you to whoever answered it and part of what's amazing for me at this moment is that this is happening at every scale from the scale of the entire planet to the most deep inward unconscious life of each of us i'm a climate activist as a lot of you know and a bunch of extraordinary stuff has happened. And something that affects us at all scales is those who benefit from the status quo, whether it's around heteronormative marriage or eliminating fossil fuels as our main energy source, are always saying to us, it is impossible to make change, that the status quo is immutable, immortal, and necessary. And it's just, you know, they're always saying like, it's impossible to change stuff. We can't possibly do that. That's too radical. That's too difficult. That's too, you know, and we have changed things dramatically. Emissions worldwide have fallen 17%. We have massively reduced fossil fuel consumption. We've changed how we live. The arguments that we can't change everything broke in March. And so we can go back to these climate struggles and say, actually, we already did change everything. Actually, you can't say it's too expensive because we pulled $3 trillion out of thin air to you know, bail out uh, some worthy and unworthy uh, entities in the US. And um, you know, immense change, we, we don't even have to talk about whether or not immense change is possible. It already happened, it can keep happening. So on that scale, but I also think something really interesting that's happening on the most intimate scale, the first month in particular of the shutdown and the pandemic, people kept saying, I can't focus, I'm not productive, I'm not getting a lot done. And I just felt like back to the butterfly soup. We're all being really productive, but in ways we can't measure somewhere deep within ourselves, like pregnant women making babies, like sick people healing, we're doing the tremendous work of adapting to something we never imagined. We are working below the level of consciousness. And I think some of that adaptation has been a new sense of vulnerability, which can be terrifying, but can also be a kind of awakening to the fragility and the value of things and to the interconnection of all things. I wrote a book about disasters 11 years ago that got, um, 
showed up a lot in the first month and a half of the disaster I got to talk about a lot is called the paradise built in hell. And it's about the communities that form in disasters. And the most extraordinary thing isn't that people do good things and behave well in disasters, although that's very cool and very useful. It's that people find in it a different sense of self and a different sense of solidarity. And that the joy in that, even in the midst of earthquakes, hurricanes, ruined cities, wars, the London Blitz, et cetera, is so extraordinary. And I thought of those moments as being like a crash course in Buddhism, a moment when people get shaken awake, like you get shaken by an earthquake out of sleep, uh, awake to your own mortality, to the fleetingness and peril of life, to what really matters, to your connection and non-separation from things around you. People are often much less attached to material things you know that your house has just collapsed around you you have to be and so has your neighbors you suddenly have something in common you you have a lot less materially and a lot more metaphysically in some ways and so i think there's a sense of all that and again what was really the most difficult thing about disasters in that metaphysical sense is that um so many people aren't able to say, this is who I want to be, this is what I want life to be. In Mexico City, after the 1985 earthquake, for complex reasons, including, I think, the, some things about Mexican culture that are a lot more awesome than ours, they were able, a kind of romantic idealism and fierceness and distrust of authority and solidarity, et cetera, people were able to do extort, build out of the experience of the earthquake permanent and lasting change. After 9-11, for example, people mostly weren't able to, you could see that incredible desire for everything to be different, that willingness to open up big questions, and the panic of the Bush administration to shut all that down. And the real war wasn't against Afghanistan and Iraq, first of all, it was against Amer the American people and their willingness to reconsider our foreign policy, our oil consumption, how we lived our lives, our impact on other countries, etc. And so we, well, Diane, one of our great San Francisco writers, and you can get her books from the Green Arcade too, Diane De Prima once said, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination, which is not about discounting physical brutality and death and suffering but how that too begins in the imagination or the death of the imagination. So we face storytelling problems and bookstores and books equip us. And though Lydia and I and Charlie are writers, I wanna say all of you are storytellers. All of you are choosing what stories to listen to and amplify and repeat and believe every conversation you have is full of explicit and implicit stories being a writer just formalizes what the rest of you what all of us do which is to find the stories that sustain us and make us and hang on to them and the stories that want to destroy us and try and break out of them and so we're all doing that work right now in a really intense and creative and terrifying and exciting way and that was really long sorry about that I get all fired No, up. that was beautiful. So we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. I'm going to combine a couple of questions that we got. Uh, Crystal asked if there was a lost book that Rebecca would recommend, something that nobody knows about that we wouldn't otherwise find. I think that's a good question for both of you. Someone also, Julieta asked if you've ever read a book that just came at the right moment and felt like it was written just for you, like a mirror. And a few people asked if there are particular books of fairy tales or other kinds of storytelling that might you know, be useful during this horrible moment. So those are three book questions and you can answer whichever or all of them, whichever you like. Oh my God, this is like when I walk into a bar and can't remember what I like to drink. If Lydia's ready to go first, I will keep, I, I, will, I will think about it. I will fill in my blankness. I can say, I can't make a perfect answer to that kind of question, but I can say something like this, which is that I think books find you in your life, like the right book at the right time happens to everybody if you let it. 
and I don't know the magical ingredients, but if you go stand near them and if one feels warmer <laughs> near your skin or if one jumps out and like grab, you know, wants to get it on with you, that's the one to pick it up. <laughs> um, but it has been true, joking aside, that in my life when something was happening, books have found me. And I remember in the 80s, for example, during the events historically that were happening then, you know, Almanac of the Dead uh, jumped out at me and got on my body and I couldn't not read it. Uh, you know, Kathy Acker's book, Empire of the Senseless, is a book I would recommend, not because it's been lost, it hasn't been lost at all. People still know about her and about that book, but because the language in that book has not been, um, you know, valorized by the market and publishing people, it's still a language that can cut into um, the speaking coming upon us, pressing down on us in a way that I would encourage people to go look at. It will not be a comfortable read. It will, it will feel like somebody's shaking you or uh, dislodging parts of your DNA, to which I say, good, that's happening to us anyway right now. We're, we're getting shaken anyway, so whatever, you'll live, it'll be fine, it's a book. Um, and then fairy tale wise, I would encourage people to explore the fairy tales of communities that are not your own. Explore the world's fairy tales. Uh, check them out, read them. Uh, ask yourself what value systems do they uh, attach themselves to what kind of bodies can survive inside this kind of fairy tale, uh, as opposed to the ones that we were maybe given or told in our own cultures to go global with your fairy tale uh, explorations. And it will remind you of things we've both said today that storytelling is a kind of stitching, it's a kind of weaving that gets us to each other in empathetic and compassionate ways. And uh, the oldest forms of storytelling, as well as the newest forms of storytelling. So that should have given Rebecca enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of a few things. Thank you. I mean, if there's probably the single most impactful book for me as a writer was Jorge Luis Borges' Labyrinth, which I bought when I was 15. And I had known I wanted to be a writer for since I learned how to read, but and I was gradually moving towards essays and nonfiction, and I didn't quite know it. When you're a little kid, books are stories, and stories are fairy tales and fictions and picture books, you know, and then everybody thinks the novel is God, which, and, you know, which is not how my pantheon is organized, but that's another story. And uh, so I was stumbling towards the nonfiction I've been writing uh, all these years, and Borges just showed me how imaginative formally and uh, otherwise uh, a short piece of something that did not, they're not necessarily nonfiction in the sense that a George Orwell essay might be nonfiction, but they're not fiction in the sense of conventional character plot um, setting either. They're kind of speculative um, explorations. Juna Barnes Nightwood, which my aunt, my bohemian literary aunt in Sonoma County gave me when I was 18, was also kind of, uh, oh, think, wow, you can do that with language. And I've had a number of books, Annie Dillard, Virginia Woolf, actually Leslie Mormon Silko, and um, et cetera, who've kind of shown me, oh, wow, you can do that. There's a anthology of nature writing, which if I left, left and walked down the hall a few steps, I could grab and hold up, edited by Daniel Halpern. That a bunch of work, including by Barry Lopez, whose Arctic Dreams was a template for me. So there's books that have supported me imaginatively in different ways, so often novels and memoirs, books of letters, reminders of other people's tragic, messed up, confusing, angst-filled um, personal life, but also books that have modeled what writing can be. And if I'm listing influences, I think something that's not completely lost, but that doesn't necessarily get treated as literature, but should, would be Our Word is Our Weapon by Subcronante Marcos and the Zapatistas. It's a series of poetic manifestos that were part of the, and declarations that they were putting out 
from their revolution in uh, southern Mexico. And they just modeled for me that political language did not have to be the dry, stale, tedious language of Marxism and its cliches, that it could be as full of image and metaphor and alive as anything. It was a kind of language revolution accompanying and you know, but integral to a revolution and the very nature of revolutions that the Zapatistas brought when they rose up the day NAFTA went into effect, January 1st, 1994. And that's been a huge impact on me too. And a kind of lifeline of romance, you know, kind of visionary idealism, but by people who are actually doing it and living it and facing the Mexican military and who now 20, Five, 26 years on have have held on and have modeled for all of us a kind of post-Marxist, post-gun model of what revolution can be. Agree, agree, agree. Um, in addition to Almanac of the Dead by Leslie Marmon Silko, which is something I would definitely uh, encourage people to read right now to see what the revolutionary possibilities are, as well as the fact that history has been delivered to us as an erroneous fiction um, in many cases. I also want to remind people uh, with my whole heart, with my whole body, to read poetry now. Poetry is the heart and life of humanity. It is the language that bears witness by and through the body. It weaves through all other languages, all cultures, all dreams, all realities. And it, it, if I was gonna say, read one thing right now in these times of despair or fear, or just, I don't know what to do, I would say, go get yourself a dozen poetry books. <laughs> and remind yourself that somebody is always witnessing and it's the poets and give it to them, let it feed you, let it remind us how we can uh, stitch together. Oh, that's I wanna, wonderful. Oh, sorry, go on. Do we, do we need to wrap up? I just, I had one more thought. That oh, I'm sure. All yeah, yeah. About, which is, um, you know, I, I did a bunch of fairy tale readings from a ton of books and they're still archived at Fairy Tales for Emergencies on Facebook, all 14 sessions. But maybe one of the biggest transformations in my imagination, when that was infinitely valuable and still shapes my everything I think and do, was Native American creation stories. Not one book, but many books of them, but maybe particularly the Kawea creation myth brought to me by the artist Louis DeSoto when we were working together in the early 90s. And the book of Genesis is uh, God, God was the boss and he made the world and it was perfect. And then the lady ate the apple and the man was corrupted by the evil corrupt woman and he ate the apple and everything went to hell and it was imperfect and flawed and ruined. And it's a story that either everything is perfect or it's fucked up and Native American creation myths are really different. There's often more than one god or a trickster god. Creation is an improvisational process with mistakes that never finishes. So there's nothing was ever perfect. Nothing was ever finished. Every day is the day of creation. There's room for improvisation. We're not all damned to perdition if we don't repent and pursue perfection because the gods themselves are imperfect. And it just opens up so much, you know, like the, the way women have been mistreated for millennia in Euro Judeo-Christian culture is the Madonna whore idea that you're either perfect and pure or you're a whore. Uh, we treat nature as either untouched by human beings or we did when the we was white people writing native people out of the, out of the historical and ecological record for the landscapes all across North America. But if you recognize that all these places, and in my second book, I focus on Yosemite, were inhabited, and therefore they were never pure as an untouched, but that didn't mean they were fallen. They were neither Mad Madonnas nor whores. They were living, you know, places where human beings were one of the species helping to shape their ecology. So that transformed everything for me. It got, it's a kind of impuritanism, anti-puritanism, it's like getting over the perfect, um, you know, church organ music and getting into some sort of jazz, hip hop, improv, and um, not to plant another music culture 
on that. But that was huge for me. And I think it's, you know, it's still really helpful for political struggles where the people looking for perfection are usually looking to subvert and corrupt. You know, bas basically, people looking for perfection in political movements are often looking for a chance to sabotage everything, not to get anything done. And so, you know, so that's actually one of the maybe almost nearly and it was part of a much larger awakening. Um, but that was transformative. And you can read coyote stories and native creation stories in dozens of books, and you should. Okay, cool. We are out of time, unfortunately. We could talk for the next few hours. This has been so beautiful, and I was so thrilled to be here for this. Um, so just really quickly, this has been part of We Love Bookstores, which is a series of fundraisers for local bookstores. Our next event this coming Wednesday, May 27th, features two amazing speculative fiction authors, N.K. Jemison and Rebecca Rowanhorse, reading and speaking for Borderlands Books. And then a week from today, we have three children's authors, Jennifer Childenko, Avi, and Amy Lucido, raising money for Town Center Books. You can see all of our upcoming events at welovebookstores.org. And Annalie, if we could unmute Patrick Marks and he could just say a couple of words about uh, Great Arcade. And, and we have raised $6,560 and a little bit more for Green Arcade. And you know he's gonna tell us how we can continue to support the store. Thank you so much, uh, everybody for the support and to Rebecca and Charlie Jane and Annalie and Lydia. And I also want to just uh, have a shout out to all the wonderful booksellers and other bookstores. And I hope you do support the series. And I think you're doing Point Reyes books as well, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, Point Reyes is June 3rd with R.O. Kwan and some other folks. And uh, Kate do a great job up there. And also, you know, I, I really would love to stay here in the hub. I think the time for activism is now greater than now. We're already uh, moving uh, several blocks from here. We're going up 40 to 45 stories. We're not uh, building enough affordable housing. I would like to be part of the uh, conversation with not only uh, supporting uh, uh, the writers and uh, but also in uh, looking after our streetscapes, uh, looking after our vulnerable people um, who are um, on the street. And, uh, and I think that a lot of us uh, are uh, socially engaged in that way. And, uh, and, and so I want to help uh, me thank everybody for just uh, supporting us today. And, um, and then uh, and especially uh, I want to say to my uh, great people who have been like furloughed, um, Andy Gillis, who is uh, in Canada taking care of his mother, um, David Duckworth, who works for the ARC and still is uh, employed, which is nice, and Ben Terrell, who's going to work for the census. Uh, so. You know, we're, we're, we are maintaining, we're doing pretty well, and I hope everybody else is too. I think we do need to, uh, you know, just love each other and, and, and stay safe. So thank you so much. And then Rebecca in the back, there's that, that map you gave me made of metal, which you can see it. Oh, now. yeah. Oh, that's Someone beautiful. had circled Tonopah on it, you know, before in the, in the olden days. And of course, they just had a 6.5 earthquake and there's been huge earthquake storms in in Nevada. So um, we live in a fantastic planet and it's moving. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, thank, thank you so much, everybody. Annalie, if you could unmute everybody, we can all say thank you and bye and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Whoa. Hello, Roxanne. Oh. I see Elizabeth. I see Jean. <laughs> Chowsers. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Hey, that was Julianne. <laughs> Stephanie. I had to mute people again because it was starting to give us horrible feedback. <laughs> Sorry. <Sounded good. laughs> <Very punk. laughs> it was. Okay, I'll, uh, let's do one more punk noise, everybody. Everyone's unmuted.
Give your pu most punk noise now. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I liked the burp myth the wolf howl. <laughs> Okay. That was fun.